Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, I invite you to please join me in prayer. Gracious God, Holy Father, we give thanks to you for blessing us with opportunity to worship your name. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you cleanse our hearts, that you clean us, that you heal us. Help us each day to seek your, your washing, that we may be revived and made new again as your children, as your saints who go before and go out, and go out to the world. So in all things, we give thanks to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's something that's rather funny to me. And maybe it's just funny to me, I don't know. But it's funny, there's a word that when you bring it up in church, it seems like, well, you can you bring it up in society, people get scandalized. They're uncomfortable with this word that's on my mind right now, this word that, well, really was not a bad word, but it seems like it could be. If you don't know what it is, which I don't even know that you do, is the word change. The word change, it seems like, not just in church, I'll be honest with you, but in our lives, we like consistency, and the word change, when we hear it, it makes us uncomfortable, it makes our skins crawl. We don't like change too much because we like what's familiar, what's traditional. We like the way things are because, well, it's comfortable. Change, when that comes around, it's uncomfortable. It throws us off our normal routines. Change is sometimes not fun. It is unexpected. I just think about this morning. When you drove here, how many of you drove the same route that you always drive to church? How many of you even didn't even look at, look at the street signs because you remembered exactly where you were going? You almost did it subconsciously. Thankfully, there was no one in the middle of the road, right? No. No. But think about this. How about this morning when you were getting ready for, for the day? How many of you have a routine that you follow that when you get out of bed, you do this, 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 and this? And you did that exact same routine today as you did yesterday, the day before, all the way back three years ago still. You know, we, we like routines, don't we? We're comfortable with routines. Whether you're retired and you have a routine, whether you're still working and you have a routine, we all like routines. Even going to school, there's routines to go to school, ways that you expect things to go. And so when change, unexpected things come into our lives, they're uncomfortable, they do throw us off. Unexpected things well, necessary, are interesting. They make life interesting. They make life hard to predict. There's a phrase that I truly disdain. Expect the unexpected. I think that phrase is, I don't know why people use it. Because if you could expect it, well, then you wouldn't, it wouldn't be unexpected. If you had control, that's what it suggests, then you wouldn't allow the change. And, well, let's be honest. If it's unexpected, it's unexpected. And the reason I bring this up is because today in our reading from the Old Testament, we have all these unexpected things that happen. We have all these events in just a small chapter of Scripture. We didn't even get the whole chapter of Scripture here from 2 Kings chapter 5. We have all these unexpected events that happen. We start out with this guy by the name of Naaman. And please turn back to 2 Kings 5 if, if you don't have the handy, if you have a Bible in front of you, or if you have your, uh, the, your bulletin. But look at 2 Kings 5. We start out with this guy. We're describing Naaman. He is this mighty man of valor. valor. He is a general in the Syrian army. He is an enemy of Israel. And the first unexpected thing. He seeks advice from who? A little girl. Not just any little girl, but a little girl who they had captured. Unexpected, isn't it? It's unexpected when he goes to Israel to meet with Elisha. See, as a mighty man of valor, while we respect Elisha as a great prophet, Naaman probably didn't. Naaman didn't know him from, from Adam's house cat. It was all, it was, he didn't know who he was at all. and So he would have been humbling himself to come to Elisha. Two things that are unexpected. Well, it keeps going. Naaman tells him, well, I will heal you. Well, God will heal you. Go jump in the Jordan River. Well, if you can. See, the Jordan River was, at certain times of the year, was what would be considered dead water. Stagnant water. Barely a trickle flows. And so you can imagine, as Naaman is hearing Elisha tell him, telling him to do this, he's, he's saying, wait a minute, I'm going to go jump in the mud and have a mud bath? I don't think so. I have these rivers over in Damascus, where I'm from, Avana and Per Per, I'm going there. Unexpected. Unexpected that this dead water brought cleansing. And then there's one more thing. The way that God did bring the healing. 
Notice, who was that guy we were talking about again? He was a Gentile, wasn't he? Naaman was a Gentile. He was not part of the promise. And yet, who brought him healing? The true God. He brought him healing. See, all these unexpected things, and if you actually kept going in the chapter, you'd find even more unexpected ways that God is working. But as we look at those unexpected things, it's not surprising to us, is it? Because how many times in the New Testament did Jesus use unexpected ways to heal his people, bring people to faith? How many times did he heal Gentiles because of their greater faith than who? The chosen people. Time and again, God uses unexpected things. And think about your life for just a minute here. Think about, and oftentimes we have to look back to see it. But how many times can you look back over your life and see the unexpected ways that God worked? You know, some of you, I know that you've battled cancer before. Or you've known people who have battled cancer. When you first get the diagnosis, as that cancer is in your body, it, it, it brings you physical pain. It brings you great emotional turmoil. It brings fear not only to you, but also to your family. And even amidst that, God can work to bring healing, to bring peace to your soul. Not always healing to your body, but peace to your soul. How many of you can look back and, and you know that, I, mean, I know that many of you, you've had your income frozen for the last three years. You can look back at that loss of income, the, maybe even a loss of a job. And how did God take you from that place of loss and bring you to a more fruitful, joyful vocation? Think about these things, especially in light of our current future. Here we live in a world, a country, where things seem to be so out of control, where it seems like the debt ceiling is looming. It's October 17th, before the end of this week. There's a lot of people, whether you work for the government or whether you're civilian employed, who are scared to death about this. Because when this debt ceiling comes, the government said that they can't pay their bills. You know, we could look at it one way and we could say, Oh Lord, what am I going to do now? Oh Lord, how on earth am I going to get through this? Or we can look at it and say, Lord, I've seen you work in unexpected ways in the past and I cannot wait to see how you're going to work through this. As terrible as this event is in our country's history, as terrible as this is in our current memory, just think about the ways that he has taken things even more terrible and worked through them. That is who our God is. He takes the unexpected of life and he works through those things to bring, to show his glory, to bring us joy, to bring us salvation. Even as you think about our salvation, it came in such an unexpected way, didn't it? And not in a way that we would expect it. He took a torture device, a, 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 a device that was meant for death, and he gave us life through it. I love the way Paul describes it too because he paints us this beautiful picture in Romans chapter 5. This picture of, of where we were. Now he doesn't try to explain the why here. He just, he just goes ahead and points out just how amazing, how unexpected God's love was. Romans 5, probably a familiar verse to many of you. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that's one of the unexpected things of history. It's the way that God worked, the way that God brought healing to us, the way that he showed us his love. See, as many times as God works in these unexpected ways, in these ways that are not what we would plan these ways that we would not call normal. We do know one thing that's consistent, and that is his love, his mercy, and compassion for each of us. And his promise. His promise that as he has died for us, that we will have life forever with him. As unexpected as that may be, that is the promise he gives us, and we trust his promises because he has shown us in the past the ways that he has kept his promises and fulfilled all his promises. Sometimes things change. And change is uncomfortable. Change is painful. Change is difficult. Sometimes the changes we face, they're unwelcome. But God works through those changes. You know, one thing that never changes is that gospel message. That gospel message that it is through Christ alone that we are saved. Even, through, even throughout Scripture we see 
that always Scripture points to the cross. It always points to the promise. It points to that same salvation. When Naaman was healed, not only physically but spiritually, when he declared that there is no God but the Lord, that was a statement of faith. When the blind saw, when the deaf heard, when the mute spoke, when they declared their faith, those were statements of faith in Christ pointing to the cross where Christ took our blackened souls, our ugly souls, our diseased souls, and he washed them with his precious blood, and he made us white as snow, and he purified us, and made us his very own. And he has given us this love, this promise to reflect to the world. He has given us this promise that even in these times of trials and tribulations, even in these times of questions without answers, he has given us a hope to reflect to the nations, a hope to reflect to the world. His love conquers all. Not my words, his words. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul makes another statement. He says that he will become all things to all people. 9 verse 23. In that verse, he's, never say, he's not saying that he will change the gospel message because he knows as soon as the gospel message itself changed, it's null, it's void, it's no longer good. But what he is saying is that however unexpected ways God will use him, he will be open to them. If God is going to send him to the Jews to proclaim the gospel, he's going to do so with boldness and respecting them where they're at. If God is going to send, them to the, send him to the Gentiles, he will go. If God will send him to the rich, to the poor, to the weak, to the, to the powerful, in all those ways, the message never change, never changes. But in all those ways, Paul will go. And sometimes it will be uncomfortable for Paul. In fact, we see that many times it was painful for Paul. But he had that passion for the Lord. He had that passion to see how God could take a sinner dead in their sins and make them alive. Make them alive in his name. He had seen it and he had experienced it and he could not help but share it. That passion is the same passion the Lord gives to us to reflect his love, to share, even in sometimes in uncomfortable places, in uncomfortable ways. Sometimes it'll mean sharing the gospel with our paper Bibles, through our paper hymnals. Sometimes it'll mean using technology. How often does our radio program once a week our radio program goes out to how many people? Through the internet, through computers. Now these are going to require changes. But in all these things, God uses these instruments, uses us to share his gospel. And never alone, but by the power of his Holy Spirit. Always through his Holy Spirit's leading and guiding. So that as we go through this life, as we see these unexpected things, we see how God is using them. And you know, one of the most important things that we need to remember every day is that God is in, the, is in control. He is taking the bad things in our world and he is making them better. He is taking the good things in our lives and he is blessing those. He is taking sinners broken by sin and death and giving them life. And he's given us the promise of eternal life. May this be the love that we proclaim and may you always see the unexpected ways, the beautiful unexpected ways God is working in your lives. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we know that change and differences and inconsistencies, unexpected occurrences, we know that they're always uncomfortable. We know that they ca cause our skin to crawl. They cause us to, to, to resist. Help us, Lord, to have open hearts and open minds to see the way that you can work, even through unexpected events and unexpected occurrences. Help us to have open eyes to see the way that you have worked in the past, the ways that you have changed our lives. And help us to have a passion, a passion for the lost and the dying, a passion for those who do not know you, that we may be passionate to share our faith and to share the gospel. Send your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and work in our lives that we may proclaim the good news to the very ends of the earth. In all things we give thanks 
and praise. Through our Savior's name, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.